Well, good morning and uh, welcome to our Grand Rounds today. Really excited to have a great friend, mentor, and collaborator, Dr. Philippe Pibereau uh, from the Institut Laval, Université Laval in Quebec. Uh, Philippe is a doctorate veterinary and medicine doctor, uh, having his degree in 1987 at the Université uh, Claude Bernard in Lyon in France, and then uh, had his biomedical sciences in Montreal in 1995. He is fellow of uh, American College of Cardiology, AHA, FAC, and has become really a uh, full professor in the Department of Medicine in Laval for many, many years, where now he has ascended to be the Canadian Research Chair in Valvular Heart Disease. He's a, really a thought leader in this field of aortic stenosis, and I recall a personal story back when I was in Pittsburgh, uh, and he came for Grim Rounds as well when we started um, this mentorship and uh, really friendship uh, that has led to many publications and uh, I see colleagues here in the audience as well that have interacted with Philippe for many, many years. He's a director of the Echo Core Lab uh, at the Quebec Heart and Lung Institute. He has published more than 650 articles and has been really a thought leader in many of the guidelines in this topic that continues to evolve. We thought that the aortic stenosis is a very simple process, but as you will understand and learn, uh, it has become much more nuanced as we start to move upstream in the treatment of these patients. Uh, he's now in the steering committee of obviously a few of these trials that he's going to talk about, the TAVR unload and the early TAVR, and we're really looking forward to his talk. Um, welcome to Minneapolis, Philippe. We we'll look forward to you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Joao, uh, I wish my mother had been here to listen to all these kind words you said. But if the, uh, if the presentation is recorded, then maybe I can send it later. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's really great to be here. Um, uh, I have a lot of friends and people uh, I have admired for a long time here. And your institution is really uh, creating a lot of uh, uh, knowledge and innovation. And uh, I remember I've, I've been here maybe 20 years ago or more present, I think, I remember it was on prosthesis patient mismatch, you know, which was a very hot topic at the time, and it still is. And, um, and your institution was already on the map and considered one of the, uh, you know, uh, most uh, productive and, and admired institution for uh, heart valve research and, and uh, heart disease research in general, and, and, and it has grown up exponentially. So the work that has been, has, has, done, has been done here has been a great source of inspiration for us, so I thank you for this. Uh, so um, I'm going to share with you some of new, the new concept and insight in the management of aortic stenosis and what I find uh, at the present time maybe the most exciting. Um, uh, so I, I do have some conflict of interest, as you see here. The, the most important one is that we are the collab for several of the major uh, trials in the field of TAVR and TVT. So if you look in the guidelines, they have these progression stages. I think it's not really stages, but whatever. It is useful to, to determine when to intervene in this disease. So you have the stage A of patients who are at risk of AS. So they don't have AS yet. They are patients with microspeed disease, with aortic cirrhosis. And then you have the stage where the patient reach mild, moderate AS. At this stage, for now, there is no indication for intervention, and the recommendation is to follow the patients. And then you have the time where the patient now has hemodynamically severe AS, but no symptoms, no LV dysfunction. That's what is called stage C1 in the American guidelines. And the dilemma here is, should we intervene now? So early AVR versus watchful waiting or surveillance. And then you have, of course, the stage where you have severe AS symptoms or LV dysfunction, which is defined in the guidelines, uh, LVF less than 50%. And here, of course, we know we have clear and strong indication for AVR. So the first concept is early AVR versus clinical surveillance in this asymptomatic CVS patient. It's a very hot topic at the present time. And I like to always start with cases because, as you know, the research ideas and the innovation and the initiation of the uh, translational research cycle starts from the observation that we do, that you do, in the clinical setting. So this is a 75-year-old woman with calcific AS. She's asymptomatic, and she's a true asymptomatic. So we put her on a treadmill. She did a good test. She has a BNP ratio versus her age and sex of 2, so 190 uh, picogram per milliliter. LVF is preserved by biplane system, uh, Simpson 60%. 
And uh, you see the valve is not looking good. You know, it is thickened, calcified, reduced opening. It's a tricuspid valve. Um, and it's severe stenosis. Peak jet velocity is 5.1 meters per second. One year ago was 4.8, which means a progression of 0.3 meters per second in a past year. She has a mean gradient of 64, big time gradient, valve area by continuity equation 0.65, index 0.35. So by all means, this is a severe, and we could say even a very severe yes, right? Um, so what should we do? She has a, a severe yes. Although she is asymptomatic, should we do an early prophylactic ADR? Or watchful waiting, so wait for symptoms or LV dysfunction to intervene. If we look at the guidelines, uh, for these patients with no symptoms, this is the uh, algorithm in the most recent edition of the guidelines, so the 2021 American guidelines. And European are similar. So if you have a, a, a CVOS, peak jet velocity more than four, there is no class one indication for AVR in this patient if they have no symptom, except if they have LVF less than 50%, okay? Or an indication, of course, for another cardiac surgery. Let's say that they have an indication for cabbage, of course, then you have to replace the valve. Otherwise, no class one indication, but there are several class 2A. If, for example, the patients, uh, when you do the exercise test, you have fallen blood pressure or reduced exercise capacity, and in this case, the patient is not a true asymptomatic, you need to replace the valve. And otherwise, if it's a patient with true asymptomatic, true CVAS, there are some risk markers you can use to consider uh, 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 early uh, AVR, and it's going to be early SAVR, according to uh, American guidelines. The European guidelines are more open, and they say SAVR or TAVR, but the American guidelines still SAVR. And you have, so very severe yes is one of the risk features, with a peak jet velocity more than five, which is the case in this patient, right? Um, if you have a markedly elevated BNP, so it's a BNP ratio more than three, she's at two, so she will not qualify for this risk feature. A rapid disease progression. How do we define rapid disease progression in the guidelines? It's a progression rate of more than 0.3 meters per second per year in peak jet velocity. So she is just on the edge of 0.3. And also, the patients need to have a low surgical risk. So there are several conditions, but this patient would qualify for this early intervention indication. Okay? So that's good. <clears throat> we look at the valve. And we do this, you know, when we, when we look at a patient with AS, we pay a lot of attention on assessing the severity of AS, looking at the valve, et cetera. But don't forget that what kills a patient is not the aortic stenosis per se. It is the consequences of the aortic stenosis on the cardiac chamber and in particular on the left ventricle. So we need to look at the left ventricle. And when we look in the left ventricle and we look at the guidelines, you, there is only one parameter to trigger intervention, LVF, and the cutoff is 50%. And if you look at the LVF in a patient with AS, most of the time you will conclude, oh my God, everything is fine. LV function is normal. This is a beautiful day with a beautiful sky and a beautiful sea. But if you look at, <laughs> if you look at parameters you know, that are more sensitive uh, to, to look at LV function, the, the conclusion might be different. And, and, you know, I try, you know, as a, I'm, I'm a French, so I try to, uh, to, to find some romantic uh, titles when I write editorials. So what I mean here was uh, what our highs see. So what you see is the LVF. You trace the LVF by, by plain Simpson, and we've spent hours tracing this LVF. It's not necessarily what your heart feels or what the heart of your patient feels, right? We have to look at other parameters, and in particular, global longitudinal strain. And this brings me to this paper that we did with my good friend, uh, Patricio Lancelotti from Belgium. It was a consortium of several heart valve clinics in different countries where we had patients with true asymptomatic AS. Most of them had confirmation by treadmill. And they had uh, moderate or severe AS. And we found two main risk markers in these patients of poor outcomes. First, peak jet velocity, a marker of AS severity. And again here, if you have very severe AS, peak jet velocity more than five, outcome is poor in the short term. So this provides further support to this class 2A indication, you know, a very severe S, and maybe it should become a class 1. And the other one was the LVF. But interestingly, in this study, because we needed to have patients with asymptomatic, no indication for intervention, all of them had LVF more than 50% at baseline. This was a inclusion criterion. Uh, but you see that the outcome varies depending on the stratum of LVF. If you have LVF more than 65%, this is great. 
if you have uh, LVF between 60 and 65%, you start to see some decline in the survival. But if LVF is less than 60%, meaning between 60 and 50, then you see an impact on mortality and in the short term. Same uh, findings here with this big study from the Mayo Clinic, led by J.O., where you see here it was more all comers. So you have LVF less than 50%, uh, 50 to 60, and more than 60. More than 60, again, survival is good. Less than 50, this is a no-brainer. You have an impact short-term and very pronounced. But between 50 and 60, those patients actually are closer, at least initially, to the less than 50 than the, to the more than 60. So I think there is an important message here. And it brings me to one of, I think, the first very important take-home message is that LVEF less than 60% should be more appropriate to define LV dysfunction and trigger AVR because LVEF lacks sensitivity to detect subclinical dysfunction. Because of the LV concentric hypertrophy, LVEF will underestimate the extent of uh, dysfunction in patients with AS. And by the way, in the most recent edition of the guidelines, you have this new indication it's a class 2B in the American guidelines, but if the LVF declines below 60 now, not 50, on three serial imaging studies, there is now a class 2B indication for AVR. And in the European guidelines, they used a lower cutoff, 55, but with a stronger indication, 2A. So interesting. So you see that this is coming, you know, that the guidelines now realize LVF, maybe we are not sensitive enough. The other approach to overcome this limitation, this uh, low sensitivity of LVF is to use the global longitudinal strain that we can easily measure now by specker tracking. We have auto strain module on our machine. And so it's very easy to do. And if you see the, the patient here that I presented you uh, at the beginning of the presentation is minus 13%. This is low for a patient with LVF. So although the LVF was 60%, she has abnormal uh, systolic dysfunction. And in this nice meta-analysis from uh, my friend Julien Mine was well, actually one of my former PhD students and now is in Limoges in France. You see that even in those with LVF more than 60%, what you will say, oh, this one, they are, they are fine. The LV function is normal. Well, still, you have one third of the patient who have reduced longitudinal systolic function, who have an LVF less than 15%, well, actually 14.7% in this meta-analysis. And if they do, it has a clinical impact. Their survival is reduced. So important message here. So I think we need to incorporate the longitudinal strain in, in, and it should be probably incorporated in the guidelines too. Another way to approach this is to look at blood biomarkers, especially BNP. And there is this nice paper from Marianne Clavel, who is now in our institution, and she did this work when she was at the Mayo with Maurice Sarano. And um, uh, they show that if you have, you know, if you look at the BNP, not the absolute value of BNP, but more the ratio of the BNP measured in the patient, versus the upper limit, upper normal limit for age and sex. You need to, to normalize, to standardize for age and sex. Well, when the BNP ratio is increasing more than one, you start to see some impact on, on mortality. And then two, it is uh, more obvious. And, and, and three, it's really, there is an impact. And this is why you have now this indication in the guidelines when the BNP is markedly elevated, you should consider earlier intervention. And, and if you, Again, our patient was at BNP of two and not three. Okay, so we've made some progress now. We, we, we look at the valve, but we went upstream and we look at the left ventricle. But don't forget the heart has four chambers, right? And we need to look at how four chambers. You know, uh, it's very important. And here I will, I will make a pause and say, let's do a parallel with oncology. Our colleagues in oncology, they grade the primary tumor, right? And then they stage the extension of the tumor, the metastasis, etc., And with this twofold assessment, they are able to re-stratify the patient and to guide which type of treatment they will use, aggressive versus like, uh, aggressive, etc. We should do the same in cardiology and especially in valvular disease. Of course, we need to grade the severity of the primary tumor, which is the aortic valve stenosis. And we do this well in general, you know, there are some that are more challenging, but and we'll come back on, on this later, but mild, moderate, severe, very important and very severe. But now we also need to stage the extent of extravalvular cardiac damage related or associated with the primary tumor. So we need to stage the, uh, you know, the extension of the cardiac damage. 
And so with Philippe Genereux from Morristown, we propose this simple classification to do this staging of cardiac damage. It is based on echo parameters and criteria that you measure every day, you know very well. So I won't go into detail, but the idea is to say stage zero would be <coughs> no evidence of structural or functional cardiac damage, which is rare in patients with moderate and even severe yes, of course. Stage one means damage at the left ventricle level. So if you have LV hypertrophy using this criteria, E of very prime more than 14 as a marker of diastolic dysfunction, and EF less than 50%. If you have one of these criteria, you're stage one. Stage two, left atrial mitral valve damage. We go upstream, okay? So dilated left atrium, moderate or severe uh, MR, and or atrial fibrillation, which is the only non-echo parameter that we have in the algorithm, but it is so important that we felt important to put it here. Stage three, pulmonary arterial tricuspid valve damage with systolic PAP, uh, pulmonary hypertension, and or moderate severe tear. And finally, stage four, damage at the level of the right ventricle, and I know here you put a lot of attention on the right ventricular function, and it's, it's very important. We know what, whatever the cardiovascular condition we're working on, when the right ventricle starts to fail, it's not a good news. Um, so we apply the simple classification to the echo pre-AVR in partner two. So partner two, this randomized TAVR versus SAVR trial in inter intermediate surgical risk. We pull together TAVR and SAVR, and this is what we got. Very powerful prediction and discrimination of the risk of mortality at one year. From the pre-op echo, applying this risk stratification, for each increase in one stage, you double or triple mortality. And, and then this, this uh, algorithm or concept has been uh, validated independently uh, by Joao when he was at UPMC at the time. And, um, and Neil, and uh, this was, I, I love this work, was published in JAMA Cardiology. And again, you know, it's a, it was a pretty large group. You know, there was uh, 689 patients from single institution, and you apply this classification and it works. You know, in real life data, you have a very powerful uh, prediction and discrimination of each stage and the risk of uh, all cause mortality and the composite of, uh, of death and readmission. Because when we proposed this concept initially with Philippe, we, need, we said it needs to be validated by others, or otherwise it would not fly. Then we did another step, which is with my uh, PhD student, Lionel uh, Tasté. Um, we actually, we had a, um, again, a, uh, it was a multi-center study, data from the several heart valve clinics, similar group as what I showed uh, with the paper from Patricio Lancelotti. And we kind of adapted this staging classification for the patient with asymptomatic severe, because previously we had work on symptomatic severe having an indication for AVR. Here now we are interested in the asymptomatic severe in order to see if this cardiac damage staging is able to predict the timing for intervention, okay? So we did a few modifications, especially in stage one. First, we changed the A over prime more than 14 for a more multi-parameter uh, criteria. So a grade two or three diastolic dysfunction according to the AAC guidelines, okay? Then EF, we increased the cutoff from 50 to 60 for the reason I mentioned before, the studies that I mentioned before. And we also added global longitudinal strain less than 15% to again improve the sensitivity of detection of subclinical dysfunction in these patients. Again, if you have one criteria, you're class one, uh, you're stage one. And then we did the other modification was in stage four. In, in addition to moderate severe uh, RV dysfunction, we added a marker for low flow state. This is true volume index less than 30. This is moderate or severe low flow state. Low flow state in the guidelines is defined as true volume index less than 35. So we used a more aggressive. And why we put it in, in stage four? Because the heart is a pump, right? So the, the purpose of the, of the heart is to pump blood, to, to have a, a normal stroke volume. If the stroke volume decreases and decreases substantially, substantially, it means that there is something wrong in at least one of the cardiac chamber. So that's why we put it, because for us it was the first phase, the first stage of decompensation, although the patient is still asymptomatic, right? So these are the results. They were striking. The um, 27 point two percent were in stage one. We were surprised to, to see that the most prevalent case, uh, stage was stage two, 46 percent. 
And we have, remember, it's asymptomatic patients, asymptomatic, true asymptomatic. And stage three, four was 14%. So you had 61% of the patients were true asymptomatic, who had advanced cardiac damage stage, meaning two, three, or four. And if they had more than two, their mortality was impacted. So th this was, you know, you see the, the red curve is the two, and you see, uh, even in the short term, you see a signal, a mortality uh, penalty here uh, that, is, uh, that is going up, and of course, stage three, four as well. If you're one or zero, you can, you can I think you can follow, you can, uh, you can uh, do clinical surveillance in these patients. So I think important take home message here is that absence of symptoms is falsely reassuring. Because you see this patient and no symptom, and you look at the echo and say, oh my God, you know, they have stage two, three, or four. And, and they are at high risk. So in patients with who are asymptomatic, I think we should probably, of course, if there are symptoms, it's a no-brainer. You have indication for AVR. But if you have no symptoms, be careful and look at the echo. The other, uh, we did other follow-up work to this with Philippe Genereux. And one of the most important one is this one we published recently in JAK. We looked, then we said, well, let's look at the changes in, in the cardiac damage staging following this successful SAVR and TAVR that we do. And I should say it has been a cold shower because you see only 15.6% of the patient, we pulled together partner two and three, so it's not only intermediate risk, low surgical risk. And we look at the change from pre-AVR to one year, and 15.6% only improved their staging. 57.9% remained the same, and you had 26.5% who worsened despite successful AVR. So uh, meaning that there are, to me, there was two important take home message. Maybe we intervene too late because you see once you have the cardiac damage stage, often, most of the cases, it is irreversible. And, and with, in worsen, this multiply mortality, subsequent mortality by 2.25. The other things is uh, the two other uh, interesting uh, findings that we made is that if you look at the, um, factors associated with worsening of the cardiac damage stage, there was hypertension. And here there is an important take home message. When we treat patients with AS, we tend to focus on the VAR disease. And we tend to forget that there are other comorbidities that we also need to treat aggressively. So I think we have to, all the adjuvant therapy, when we do a successful TAVR, don't forget to treat hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, etc. Otherwise, the treatment would be futile. The other thing is you see surgical AVR was associated with worsening uh, of the cardiac damage. So, uh, and, and it was essentially worsening and um, especially new onset of right ventricular dysfunction. So I think, you know, if you have patients with already advanced cardiac damage to start with, uh, two and especially three and four, it is probably preferable to use uh, a, a type of that, than a type. And this summarizes how we can implement the cardiac damage stage in our practice. So uh, if you're asymptomatic CVS patient, stage two or more, this is maybe an argument to consider early AVR, okay? Another argument in addition to what you already have in the diagram. And if you have a patient with symptomatic CVS and already indication of, uh, of AVR, I think if you have stage three or four, clearly there are more and more evidence that TAVR is preferred. So there are some trials that already Look at the timing of AVR in these asymptomatic patients. This is a, a small trial from South Korea. There were 70 patients, about 70 patients in each arm, so it's, it's a small sample size, but still. Um, early SAVR in this case was associated with uh, a lower rate of mortality and cardiovascular mortality compared to conservative management. It was not all common uh, patients. It was only patients with very severe, so peak jet velocity more than five, okay? And it was only with SAVR. And um, this is where I come to TAVR, because TAVR has been a revolutionary, as you know, in our field. This is the, the first uh, TAVR performed 20 years ago. So we, we had the, uh, the 20th anniversary in Rouen, actually, uh, last spring. And uh, Alain Cribier is a, is a good friend of mine. I actually uh, saw him uh, last Monday. I was in Rouen presenting. and. Um, this has been, uh, we, when we think about this and say, wow, this probably has been, uh, you know, they did the first in man, and then this has been a, 
uh, easy journey. I can tell you that the, uh, when I talked to Alain, this it was so much resistance, you know, when they did this first study, and they were even by his own colleagues was uh, criticized and. Uh, uh, saying it was a fool, it was crazy, it will kill patients, etc. And at first they were only treating patients with cardiogenic, uh, cardiogenic shock. This was the inclusion criteria. So they needed to come and so they were coming from all over the France uh, in cardiogenic shock and uh, trying, you know, so it was really a, a rescue type of intervention. And, uh, but we are 20, more than 20 years ago and now some millions of people got this intervention. It's amazing. So it's, it's a revolution. And this has also um, markedly increased our ability to do trials because this, you know, early TAVR versus clinical surveillance trial, we've been worked on it for maybe more than 15 years with uh, Bob Bono. Uh, oops. No, okay. Sorry, Bob. It's not going to be long. I'm moving too much. So uh, it, it, um, we've worked with Bob Bono, Pat O'Gara, Catherine Otto, and, and others, and Maurice Sarano, to, uh, to uh, propose to NIH a trial. But it was difficult, because at the time, we only had SAVA. And you're proposing to patients who do not complain of anything. They are asymptomatic. You say, oh, we're going to do an open-heart surgery with a two-month recovery, et cetera, versus waiting. So they say, oh, you know, doctor, I'm going to wait. <laughs> so now with TAVR, we this has made these trials possible, and this has made, in particular, early TAVR trials possible. So this is a big trial, as you know, and um, recruitment is, is uh, over, so patients need to be, and this is all common, you know, asymptomatic, severe. They are confirmed to be truly symptomatic with treadmill, which is, I think, a strength of the trial, and randomized transfemal TAVR versus clinical surveillance, and the, um, well, the primary endpoint is at two years. So we have to wait another year or so to get the, the results of this trial. Um, so for the, this is the first component of my, my talk so about this asymptomatic severe. No class one indication for this patient, unless they have this LVF less than 50% or indication for other cardiac surgery. But you have several two A's. If very severe AS, yes, fast stenosis progression, elevated BNP. We have this new indication, finally, with the LVF less than 60%, or in the European uh, guidelines, less than 55%. And um, I think the cardiac damage stage concept is really helpful and, and of course, will, will now be applied to other valvular disease. There has already been some publication in MR, in AR, and so it, it is, I think, expanding rapidly. So stage two, I think we should consider early, so stage two or more early AVR in asymptomatic AS. And in patients with already indication, I think stage three or more is an argument for using uh, the least invasive uh, approach to more transfemoral TAVR. And several trials are ongoing. I mentioned early TAVR, but there are others huh, that are ongoing. So now low flow, low gradient AS. That's uh, one of the, uh, maybe the subset of patient where I, post, uh, I spent a lot of time of my career on this. Uh, this is a challenging group, especially to confirm stenosis severity and indication. This is a controversial group. So how do we define this low gradient is? Uh, it's patients with discordant grading at the, rest, uh, at the resting echo. So they have a valve area that is severe, less than one, but the gradient is not severe. So it's less than 40, peak jet velocity is less than four. So you have a discordance here. You know, the valve area tells you, oh, stenosis is severe, patient should undergo AVR. Gradient is, oh, no, 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 stenosis is not severe, wait. So we have three subsets of patients in this big category. You have the, on the left, the classical low flow, low gradient with the low EF. These patients are, are known for a long time. You know, we knew that when you have a low EF, you may have a low flow and a low gradient despite the severe EF, and you should do the double vitamin stress echo. And this is, in fact, the HREF form of EF, right? Then you have patients with preserved EF, but nevertheless, they are low flow state. Low flow defined in the guidelines gains troponin index less than 35. And that's what we call, the, what we call like, in, uh, now, so, so, more than 10 years ago, the um, paradoxical low flow, low gradient AS. Yes. Why paradoxical? Because they have low flow despite preserved AS. Yes. And this is, in fact, the H perform of AS, yes, right? D3 stage in the guidelines. And then you have the normal flow, low gradient. They are not really addressed, well addressed in the guidelines, not addressed at all in the American guidelines, a little bit in the European guidelines. And these are patients with 
preserve the F, normal flow according to stroke volume index, and they still have this challenging situation where they have the discordant grid, and we don't know what to do with them, okay? So future direction for research. So this is a case of paradoxical low flow, low gradient, often seen in elderly women, um, often with concomitant hypertension, she is symptomatic, uh, LVF by Bamplate Simpson is 65%, so it's a true uh, normal LVF, but again, global longitudinal strain is reduced here. So again, normal EF doesn't mean normal systolic function. And she has grade two diastolic dysfunction, impaired feeling, increased feeling pressure, and because of this impaired longitudinal strain, impaired feeling, you have a pronounced concentric cream modeling with small cavity. Yes, LVF is normal, but you know, 65% of nothing is still nothing. So that's why the stroke volume is reduced. This patient is in low flow state. It's a paradoxical low flow. And if you look at the valve, clearly uh, not looking good, right? But you know, the gradient is only 26. It's a modest gradient, you know, and uh, eventually some cardiac surgeons will be reluctant to operate in a patient with such a low gradient, especially if EF is preserved. And valve area is clearly severe. Doppler velocity index that I always like to look at in this patient is also severe. So this is the entity that we described in 2007 in circulation for the first time. We actually had 18% uh, in this court who had the, this entity that we call paradoxical low flow, low gradient, defined as small valve area, uh, low gradient, low flow in preserved EF. And these patients were associated with worse prognosis. And we said, well, maybe we underestimate the severity in this patient and this patient are undertreated. And, um, and the, the, the pathophysiology, you know, it's really uh, uh, this type of patients where you have pronounced concentric remodeling. They often have, you know, concomitant hypertension. They have impaired longitudinal uh, uh, systolic function, impaired diastolic filling, and often also AFib, MS, MR, TR, that all contributes to reduce the forward stroke volume, although the LVF is normal. So they are in low flow despite preserved EF. So they are in paradoxical low flow. And also cardiac amyloidosis, don't forget, that is highly prevalent in this patient, but again, may contribute to the low flow state. And if you're in low flow state, then everything is more difficult in terms of confirming stenosis severity. Because the valve area may be pseudo-severe, the gradient may be pseudo-normal, you may have a low gradient despite severe AS, and so you need to con a way to confirm the stenosis severity, whatever it is. So that's interesting because my, my mentor, uh, Jean Dumenil, uh, who unfortunately passed away this week, um, uh, always told me, you know, Philippe, when you have a new concept, especially when it is quite new, it will always take 10 years to be accepted. And for the paradoxical low flow, low gradient, actually went faster because we published in 2007 and in 2012, it was already included as a new indication. So class 2A, you know, in the guidelines, both guidelines. And then to 2021, it came, it, it moved from 2A to 1 in the American guidelines, but not in the European guidelines for whatever reason, you know. They have the same evidence, but they come to different conclusions. It's always difficult to understand. But now you have a class one indication. Yeah, you know, and you know what Maurice Tarano is saying about the guidelines. Huh? Uh, it's like sausage. If you knew how they would, they would uh, be, uh, you know, uh, prepared, you would never eat them. Um, but anyway, no, I, I'm kidding. I, I, I'm a strong believer and uh, I respect the guidelines. Um, but sometimes you have discrepancies and you don't know, understand why. But so there were two things important in these guidelines. First, the indication for CT to confirm the stenosis severity. It is now a class two indication in both guidelines. You can use it to confirm stenosis severity in this patient because the vitamin stress echo is not the optimal test. And if you have evidence of CVAS, symptomatic patients, class one. So, and they, I like this algorithm that we have in the European guidelines where actually they say, well, if you have this discordant grading, small valve area with low grade, first thing, check the accuracy of your measurement, rule out measurement error, you know, especially a VOT diameter, things like that. So if you have really this discordant grading, look at the flow LVF status. If it's a low EF low flow, classical low flow, it's a low dose of vitamin stress echo that is recommended to differentiate true severe versus pseudo severe AS, right? Using this criteria. If it's a preserved EF normal flow, so the paradoxical low flow, the D3 stage, the vitamin stress echo, you know, LVF is already preserved, you have a pronounced concentric remodeling, it's probably not the ideal test for this patient. You should use calcium scoring. But as you know, you need to use different cut point in men and women, very important. 
more than 2,000 in men and 1,200 in women. So if we come back to the patient uh, we mentioned, uh, she has a very high calcium score for women. I mean, it's huge. So she underwent TAVR and, and did well. And this is where I get to amyloidosis. I, as I said, especially the patient with low fluoro gradient, paradoxical low flow even more, they often have a, um, a Trojan horse, which is the, uh, uh, the amyloidosis, you know? And so if you have the red flags of amyloidosis, this, you know, if you have history of carpal tunnel syndrome, right bundle blood block, uh, uh, et cetera, and this biventricular hypertrophy with the sparkling of the myocardium, don't hesitate to do a bone scintigraphy to confirm the trans uh, amyloidosis. And also, there are more and more evidence, and we'll have a, a review paper published in, in, um, in um, uh, Nature Cardiovascular Reviews um, uh, with, uh, with Jagat Narula, um, where there are more and more evidence that amyloidosis may be a cause, a primary cause of aortic stenosis. In other words, it does not only infiltrate the myocardium, it also infiltrates the valves and the aortic valve, and so may cause a, a, a more fibrotic or non-calcific type of AS. And there's this publication where actually they report several cases of amyloidosis who really had true severe AS, but they were negative and CT because the cause of the stenosis was not the calcium, but was the, um, was the amyloid. So how can we overcome this situation? Because it is true that we often say, oh, it's calcificase. No, it's not calcificase. It's fibrocalcificase. Especially in women, women often have less calcification but more fibrosis. So when we do a CT, and that's why we need to use different cut points, we underestimate the severity. So recently, with our friends in Scotland, Mark Dweck and, and others, we, we came up with this new um, imaging technique, which is instead of using non-contrast CT as recommended in the guidelines, we use contrast CT. CT angio, because with CT angio, we are able to not only see and quantitate the volume of calcium, which is shown in green on the, on the slide, but also of non-calcific tissue, so fibrotic and, and other type of tissue. So for example, if we focus on the two uh, bottom panel, you see the one here is, the, is a man. And uh, most of the burden is calcification, is green, right? Whereas here on the right, it's a woman, and very little calcification, but a lot of fibrotic tissue. And if we look, the hemodynamic severity was about the same in these two patients, CVAS with similar gradients, but the cause of the gradients is different. You know, essentially, the fibrocalcific burden, you know, if we look overall, is the same, but different composition. One is calcium, and the other one is fibrous tissue. So what do we do in terms of type of EVR in this low flow, low grade? Classical or paradoxical? This is not randomized. This is from the Topaz study, multicenter registry, on which we have worked from several years now for, with Joao and, and Mio. Um, so uh, it's not randomized, so it should be taken with a grain of salt. But I think you know, in those vulnerable ventricle and cardiac chamber, the least invasive approach is the way to go. So transfemoral TAVR, followed by SAVR, alternative access TAVR, not as good. And conservative management, if you do nothing with a severe stenosis, even if it's low gradient, it is bad bad outcome, right? So this brings me to other tools that we can use to improve the risk stratification and maybe the indication, indication for intervention. This is a great collaborative work that we did with, with uh, Mio and Joao. Um, so this is from the multi-center TOPA study. We had from the beginning, not from the beginning, but we had uh, implemented the CMR. And so several centers were involved and uh, all the analysis were done by uh, Joao and Mio. Thank you so much for this. I mean, this has been a huge work. And, and, and the results were very uh, compelling and very logical. Three main risk markers were identified and providing incremental prognostic value versus clinical and echocardiographic markers. Um, the uh, global launch nose strain again, <laughs> but here measured by CMR. Uh, the presence of LGE, so focal fibrosis, which we know is not good, and the expansion of the extracellular volume as a marker of interinstitutional fibrosis. And when you have you know, a combination of this risk marker, of course, the outcomes is uh, really uh, becoming very, very poor. So I think uh, I already uh, showed this, this slide, but I just added this. I think this staging classification that we proposed was a first proof of concept. And we said, well, now let's 
uh, the others kind of improve this. And I think we can uh, reinforce uh, this, this staging by adding blood biomarkers, as we saw BNP and maybe eye sensitivity troponin, but also CMR parameters, especially the three risk marker we... So I think now we need to test that, I think, uh, Joao and Neil. So for these patients, DSC is useful, but more for the dose with low EM, okay? Otherwise, the way to go is CT, you know? And I would say, even in our institution now, even with the low EF low flow, I have to confess that sometimes we go directed to a calcium score. Simpler than the dobutamine. And often when you do the dobutamine, you know, and at the end of the dobutamine, you're still stuck because, you know, the, the flow has increased, but not enough. So you still have the discordant grading, or you have to stop prematurely because the patient is getting, getting arrhythmias, et cetera. So often the dobutamine stress echo, I realize, is inconclusive, and we still have to do the calcium score. So uh, given that, you know, sometimes we are lazy, we go directly to calcium score. I do not mean that it is what is recommended in the guidelines, but this is what we do often. So AVR is now recommended, you know, and it's most of the indication as high as has in high gradient AS, so class one. And I think transfemoral power is really something we should do. Um, so uh, just kind of back, yeah. Uh, so, well, just wanted to mention in the other one that uh, there is this perspective of, uh, CT, NGO, to better appreciate and quantitate the fibrocalcific burden, not only the calcification. Um, so now this is a, a topic that is close to my heart. Um, that is very the next frontier. We are not yet there. But so what we call, uh, we, we discussed with asymptomatic severe. Now let's put it at the moderate AS SOS. Uh, so now we are talking about early AVR versus clinical surveillance in patients with moderate AS. Symptomatic at risk moderators, but moderators, okay? This is what is maybe coming. So again, at the present time in the guidelines, there is no class uh, one or two A indication for valve replacement in moderate AS, okay? That, that, that is clear. Um, the only indication that you have, and it is a two B, if you have a moderate AS and there is an indication for another cardiac surgery, again, cabbage or whatever, it is eventually you can consider replacing the valve. And it's a 2B. So now again, a case. That's my third one. Very poor LVF. And we have, a, again, a discordant gradient here with a, a, a gradient that is low, 22. The valve area is severe, 0.85. So we do a dobutamine stress echo. And in this patient, there is a good flow reserve, contractile reserve. You see the stroke volume is going up. The mean flow rate is going up. The LVF is going up. And the mean gradient is increasing, but at the end of the vitamin stress echo is still moderate. Still less than 40, right? 32. And the valve area that was CV at rest is now 1.2, so it's moderate. So it, this is an example here where the vitamin stress echo has reconciled the valve area and the gradient and now telling you stenosis is moderate. Okay, so there is no indication for AVR and the patient is fine, right? No, I think, you know, the question is now, okay, this is moderate AS. Yes. This, this is not no AS or my AS. This is moderate AS in a patient with really systolic heart failure, very bad LV, right? So is it benign for this patient, do you think? The answer is no. This is here all common with moderate AS and different degrees of AS. This is very, very large registry, nation-based Australian registry, uh, ECHO database, um, the NIDAD registry. And what you see is very interesting. So the blue bars are the five-year mortality and the black are the one year. And you see, here is the no AS, the reference group. And already with mild AS, you see marked increase in mortality, right? Mild versus no. And then with moderate AS, you have another step. And then with CVS, another one. But look at moderate AS is almost as bad as a CV. And you may say, oh yeah, but this is because, you know, the moderate AS or the mild has progressed to severe. But okay with five-year mortality, but even the one-year mortality, you know, is, uh, is, is substantially higher in moderate versus no AS. And you may say one year to progress from moderate to severe, maybe, but not in, in all patients, right? So there is something here that is wrong, right? AS is not, the moderate AS is not benign. So this is a study that we did with three other centers. It was retrospective, patients with moderate AS and depressed EF. And the outcome is not good. At four years, 61% had either died underwent AVR or heart failure hospitalization. And then we did another study because we've been criticized in this previous paper that we had no control group 
They wanted, uh, the review wanted uh, to have a control group with heart failure, but no AS. So we say, okay, we're going to do that now. So uh, we have this group with heart failure, no AS, a match for age, sex, and LBF. And now you have the moderate AS treated by AVR, uh, that's the red curve, that is uh, almost, um, you know, with the uh, uh, heart failure and no AS. And then you have those with moderate AS, not treated by AVR, and they have a very bad outcome. So I think the message here is what is moderate AS for a good ventricle with a good systolic function may actually be equivalent to severe for a depressed ventricle. It's always a question of balance between the magnitude of the pressure overload of the hemodynamic burden imposed uh, by the AS versus the ventricle, what the ventricle and the other cardiac chamber are able to handle, right? So moderate AS, good ventricle, that's fine. Moderate AS, bad ventricle, HREF or HPEF, it could be detrimental, right? So this is what led us to propose this provocative trial. It was almost now 10 years ago, <clears throat> and it's a 300 patients uh, trial, and also, so that's patients with moderate AS, systolic heart failure, just as the patient I showed you. That's a typical type of patient we recruit in tavern load. And we randomized them to tavern now, although the stenosis is still moderate, right? Versus optimized heart failure therapy in medical. And um, so the, uh, uh, the, we are still recruiting. This, the recruitment has been a bit slow because it's an investigator-driven driven trial and not as much you know, logistic and funding as the industry-sponsored trial. But we are getting there, and hopefully uh, we got the results in in, in um, two years from now. Um, and now there is another trial, as you know, that has been initiated a few months ago, much larger one, the PROGRESS trial. And the um, inclusion is broader than Tavern load. So this is moderate AS with <clears throat> uh, symptoms or evidence of cardiac damage or dysfunction using the cardiac damage uh, we, uh, we propose. Philippe Genero is the PI of this PROGRESS trial, that's why. And, and so this is a pretty good chunk of the moderate AS population, I have to say. And they're randomized to, again, transfemoral TAVR now versus clinical serving. <clears throat> and I don't like the word, you know, watchful waiting that we are using before. Watchful waiting means that you wait the patient for calling you back and say, hey, you know, I think I'm not feeling well. You may sometimes wait forever, you know, and the patient will not call you back. So I think it's more, we need to have, when we decide not to intervene, we need to be active. You know, and we need to, to have appointments and have them followed in heart valve clinic otherwise. So if we summarize, here we have the grading of the severity. On the top, we have the staging. For those with symptomatic severe, we already have indication in class one and threes. For the asymptomatic severe, we have now this trial. Early TAVA, I mentioned. AVO is a Scottish uh, trial. We should have the results, I think, uh, next year as well. EZAS is a one that is pretty large, but as, uh, still in recruitment. And then you have the moderate AS with advanced cardiac damage staging, which is probably the next frontier, with three trials ongoing. Three trials, Tavern and Load, Progress, and I did not mention Expand, but there is also Expand that is uh, addressing these patients. So stay tuned because, I mean, the way we're gonna treat the patient with, with AS may change uh, rapidly. So in terms of uh, these patients, well, Again, don't take me wrong. Moderate AS is well tolerated in most patients, and there is no indication for, 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 for intervention in this patient. However, if you have moderate AS with some evidence of cardiac damage, structural or functional changes, they should probably be followed more closely. And um, so we, we, uh, we have these trials, and we have to, to stay tuned. So I just want to um, mention that I have a little... Um, I would say, reservation or maybe in comfort with also this trial, in which I'm strongly involved, you know, early tower and, and progress, is that we are looking for expansion of indication. On the other end, you have this type of paper showing that we have a major gap between the uh, indication for AVR, and, and we are talking about class one indication, versus actually the patients who actually receive the AVR. So, and even with TAVA, we say, well, with TAVA, we're probably going to close this gap, you know, and we're going to be able to address more patients with already established indication. Well, no, you see, there is still about a good third of the patients who have firm, who have strong indication for AVR, who actually do not get it for 
different threats. And this issue is more important in women, and this is another topic that is close to my heart. We do have differences and disparity in the, the delivery of care in women with valvular disease. They are, uh, under detection in valvular disease is a major issue. We estimate according from a, a, a survey from UK that about 50% of patients who have significant valvular disease, we're not talking about the mild AS, you know, the stage A or B. We're talking about patients with moderate severe, they are not detected. They don't know they have the disease, their family doctor, their cardiologist don't know they have the disease, period. So we have a really, we need to improve. And this is more pronounced in women. Um, and women also present at the least two stage of the disease to intervention. We underestimate the symptoms, we underestimate the severity of AS. And they have a different way to respond to treatment. They have a different type of disease, as we said, more fibro, uh, fibrotic than calcific. The other uh, important thing is there is a risk of underdiagnosis and that the treatment is higher also in all the racial and ethnic minorities. In, in, um, in Canada, the First Nation are underserved and underrepresented population, and we have to do better here. So the message I want to say is that before expanding to new population and lower risk population, maybe we have to do an effort and pay attention to first treat the patients who already have indication and who are at higher risk. So I will go uh, rapidly on this one, but I think it's important to mention because after a long wait and uh, many studies, more basic research studies, I think there is a light at the end of the tunnel and we may see, before we get retired, <laughs> uh, uh, pharmacotherapy for AS. And again, it starts from observation from a patient. You have this patient, 57-year-old patient, very young patient like me. And um, <clears throat> it was actually in a research project because he had a mild AS, you know, and said, oh, we're going to put you in a, it's a called a prospective observational cord. So we are doing echo, we are doing uh, CT, and we are doing CMR. And we, we you know, uh, mild AS really at baseline. And after 2.5 years, he had progressed to severe AS, and calcium score has doubled, you know, in two, about two years. This is one of the fastest progression I've ever seen. And then we are looking, what's happening? Maybe we missed the biker speed valve, but no, the valve is trying to speed, no, uh, normal, normal, uh, congenitally normal valve. And there was no risk marker, the patient was not diabetic, was not, he was athlete, um, vegetarian, you know, I said, oh my God, what's happening? The only thing is that he had high LP. The, the proprietary K. And this brings me to this paper that you know where there was a, an association between a SNP on the LPA gene and the presence or absence of aortic. It was more like a yes or no uh, type of study. So there was a presence or absence of aortic valve calcification, not even aortic valve stenosis. And, um, but this was the start of everything. And, and then we did, uh, we recycled the, the data of the astronomer trial. So the astronomer trial was one of the three statin trial that was a failure because we had assumed that yes was an atherosclerotic disease, but it's not only that. <laughs> and so we found, however, in this study that the patient with high LPA had faster progression of AS as measured by echo and also higher rate of AVR and event. So the LPA, yeah, is bad because it carries uh, um, uh, oxidized phospholipid uh, which is a bit the, the gas, if you want, and uh, it, it brings this ox uh, oxidized phospholipid within the valve, and then with different um, enzymes, especially LPPLAD, and ototaxin is really uh, important, uh, it will, it will uh, generate uh, lisophosphatidic acid and lisophosphatidic choline, um, which are really the bad guys. They are uh, stimulating fibrosis, <coughs> inflammation, calcification, and eventually uh, AS. So now we have this trial. So that's why I'm saying we are, maybe we have a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, this is gonna be done with Pelacarsen, which is uh, uh, an oligonucleotid antisense uh, directed to EPOA, and was very specific in blocking the synthesis of LPA at the, at the level of the liver. And it's like a very specific and very pro profound effect, you know. It reduced the LPA by 80%. And with one injection a month, you're, you're pretty good to go. So it, I mean, it's a bit like PCSK9 um, type of uh, approach. Uh, and, and so we're gonna have, it's, it's gonna be a, um, a 500 patients or so randomized to placebo versus pilacarsen 
and we're going to use echo and CT. So interesting in this study, we're going to have two co-primary endpoints, imaging endpoint, change in peak velocity measured by echo from baseline to three years, okay? Because we need three years because it's mild, moderate AS at baseline. And, and or uh, the change in calcium score measured by CT. And this is actually what we had recommended when we did this paper with Brian Lindman on behalf of the Alvalve collaboratory. There was uh, some authors were from FDA. We, 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 we wanted to, to, to convey the message that we have to, in AS, we have to um, maybe move away from having primary endpoints that are clinical endpoints, like AVR or DEF, because otherwise you need a huge amount of patient, a huge amount of money, and a huge amount of time. And we have to use imaging endpoints um, as, as primary endpoints. It has been, a, I would say, a negotiation with FDA, but now they accepted it. And I think, you know, the best primary endpoint are probably changing hemodynamic severity as measured by peak velocity by echo and changing anatomic severity by, by CT. And if you can do both, you're very complementary and synergistic. You know? And you need to wait for three years. You know, FDA will not accept less than three years. I think it's really... Uh... So again, this is, AS is a complex, multifaceted disease. It's not only lipid-mediated inflammation atherosclerosis. It is also hypertensive disease with activation of the renin-angiotensin system. It is an osteoblastic disease uh, and with some association with osteoporosis. And, well, there are several trials that have been done so far. Um, statin, they failed. Uh, but also the anti-osteoporotic uh, medication in SALTI2 failed. Vitamin K failed. Um, so we have several ongoing. One in our institution with OBS, um, interestingly, because I think we can have a benefit at the level of the valve, the myocardium, and maybe the aorta as well. Uh, LPA lowering, as we discussed, will start soon. We have one with atakiguat, which is more targeting endothelial dysfunction, D DPP4, and uh, there will be there are some PCSK9 um, trial in the cooker uh, yeah. coming soon. But remember, women and men are different. This is one of the most important discovery of my research program. Um, uh, and especially of uh, the research program of Marianic. And women have a different type of disease, more fibrosis cell classification. So we know already, I don't know which drug will work, but what I can tell you is that the one drug fits all will not work in AS. We will probably, the, the drug that will work in, in, in men, for example, targeting calcification will not work in women and maybe vice versa. So we need to tailor the therapy we will need to tailor the therapy according to age, sex, and AS severity. So we'll need a multi-drug approach, as we do in heart failure, right? Um, and this tailored to the patient. So to summarize uh, what I've covered in my talk, for the mild moderate AS, uh, there is no indication, but we do have some trials. There is pharmacotherapy trial in mild moderate, and these uh, progress trials and others in uh, early TAVR versus clinical surveillance in moderate AS. For the asymptomatic severe, we have all these uh, uh, strategy trial, trial uh, testing the timing of intervention. And uh, for the, um, the, the, even the severe AS with indication and uh, symptomatic AS, there are some trials and very interesting trials. There is a, a TAVR versus SAVR trial. You may say, but we already have partner one, two, three, and evolute low risk, et cetera. But there is a RAYA trial. Why do we have the RAYA trial? It, RAYA is a partner tree trial, but for women only. Because when we look at the data of partner tree and evolute low risk, we realize that 70% were men and only 30% were women. So women were underrepresented. So now we are kind of trying to catch up and doing a trial for women only. The other one that is interesting ongoing, because I think we, are, we have to test this as well, is to say, well, we have always assumed that all Tava valve are equivalent. Maybe yes, maybe not. So, but we have to do the trial comparing balloon expandable versus self-expanding. So uh, there is uh, already the SMART trial in the US, um, more in this patient with a small analyst that is ongoing, but there is the BEST trial. So the BEST trial is similar funding as uh, MitroClip, MitroFR. Uh, it's funded by the French government, which has an advantage because it is not funded by any of the two companies that, is, that are opposed in this trial. So, and it's going to be um, uh, 1,800 patients, 1,862, and they are randomized to a balloon expandable uh, with the uh, Sapien 3, Sapien 3 Ultra, 
versus self-expanding with the evolute pro, uh, et cetera. And uh, um, the, uh, the primary endpoint is at 90 days. It is a mortality at 90 days, uh, based on some study that he, they did with the France Navy Registry and published in circulation where they are the difference at 90 days. And we are the collab. Uh, the problem with the funding from the French government, it was limited. So we, we applied to the Canadian Institute of Health Research to fund the collabs for the uh, ECHO and, and CT collabs. So, and I would like to thank all the um, organization that uh, helping me and uh, especially Heart Valve Voice Canada because we did recently this report on the patient care pathway. It has been a huge work, but I think it's very helpful. And I want to thank my team because they're really those who are doing the work. And you see the ratio of women versus men. Huh? Uh, it's definitely uh, definitely in favor of women. So uh, because again, women, uh, uh, well, first they have a longer life expectancy. So still, so it's a better investment for my lab. They are multitasking. <laughs> they are multitasking, whereas us men, we are not as good at this. And they have a different form and much more interesting uh, type of disease. And is here, you know, uh, um, top right, this is my older daughter, Mia. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, this was outstanding. Uh, congratulations for such a beautiful team and, and so elegantly putting into the perspective of this journey that you have uh, contributed so much. I wanted to thank also United Therapeutics and Edwards Life Sciences for uh, today's Grand Rounds. I'd like to open the questions for the audience. It's great to see a complete full house here. Uh, it demonstrates the interest on this topic. Uh, yes, Dr. Nick Burke. Really, two questions. One, what percentage of patients with aortic stenosis have elevated LP little a? Is that a big problem or is it not a big problem? And secondarily, since it, particularly in men, the calcium seems to be a problem, what about chelation? Yeah, so um, first, the, if we look at LPA, elevated LPA, um, it is in the general population, so for example, in the room where we have a sample, you know, 20% of the population have what is considered elevated LPA. So how many of you are there LPA testing? Raise your hand. Okay. So you see, um, <laughs> you need to have this at least. The good thing, the good thing is you only need once in your lifetime uh, because it is genetically determined. And once you know what it is, and if it, let's say it is elevated, if you, even if you uh, start to exercise do, uh, one marathon a month, uh, become a a vegetarian monk uh, meditating uh, like several times a day, it will not change. It will change your LDL, but your, LD, your LPA is like fixed forever. So the only thing you can do is having a medication that targets LPA. So, so coming back to your question, okay, so it's 20% of the general population. But if I apply strictly the uh, inclusion-exclusion criteria uh, in the pillar carsen study that we're going to initiate soon to the observational course study that we're doing, it would be 15% of the patient would be uh, eligible because you need the elevated LPDA, you need mild, moderate AS, severe AS probably too late. Um, so it, it's not, certainly again, it's not addressing all patients with, with uh, so it's not, a, it's not a huge number that we're gonna be able to treat. Uh, but I think it's, it is one piece in the puzzle and we may need a, a, a medication for the other patient. And yes, maybe chelation for calcification I mean, it's always, you know, the, the ratio versus efficacy versus safety, you know, that is always the, uh, the big concern that we would have. Um, but I think we need, because obviously everything that was targeting, the trial that was targeting calcification and fossil calcic metabolism, obviously they failed, you know, uh, all the anti-osteoporotic uh, and the, um, the vitamin K was also in this, uh, they all failed. So I think we need new ideas and maybe new, uh, and maybe, I don't know, maybe calcification is maybe too late to target. That's the other thing. The best we can do with calcification is stabilize, right? Uh, regression, I think, will be difficult. And that's why uh, it is important to treat as soon as possible in the course of the disease if we want to have an effect. Uh, because then after it's more a snowball effect, you know, once you have the calcification, it's like self entertained process and it's much more difficult to, to slow or block. Or block. All right, Dr. Travis and then Dr. Lesser. 
Thanks for that great talk. Two quick questions. Um, the role of left ventricular hypertrophy, does it have any Im impact in you know, how you risk stratify these patients? And then what are all these patients dying from? Is it sudden cardiac death or progressive heart failure, myocardial infarction? Has anyone looked at the causes of why, you know, the mortality? Was it for patients with moderate AS or no. all comers? All comers. Yeah, so LV hypertrophy, I think, has an important role. And um, it is, by the way, in the cardiac damage stage uh, algorithm, that's the first criteria you know, in stage one. So uh, it, it is one of the, I think, risk markers. Um, if we look selectively, uh, we did some study where we look at the impact of LV hypertrophy on the uh, outcomes. It has an association, but it is not huge. Because I think you know, the LV hypertrophy, as we measured by ECHO or by CMR, is only, only measuring the magnitude of the hypertrophy, but not the nature. And this is why I think that CMR with ECV and LG becomes important. Because if it's, a, <clears throat> um, if it's hypertrophy, but essentially myocellular hypertrophy has probably better prognosis and better chance to regress after intervention. But if it's, if it's fibrotic hypertrophy, this is not as good. So I think we, we need to look at LV hypertrophy at the you know, magnitude. But we look also. We absolutely need to implement, and this is what is missing in the clinical management of until now: is the nature of hypertrophy. Is it more myocellular? Is it more fibrotic? It is more diffuse fibrosis versus focal fibrosis. Focal fibrosis, you know, unfortunately, will not regress. You know, the diffuse there is a, some the reactive diffuse may regress to some extent, may take time, but uh, yeah. And the other uh, the mortal causes of mortality. Is cause of mortality is is really multiple. Uh, it, there is some sudden cardiac death. However, I have to say the, um, the, the, the rate of sudden cardiac death in the asymp true asymptomatic severe has been relatively low and probably does not justify by its own you know, the consideration of earlier intervention. Um, the other cause, you have heart failure, you have, you know, uh, all, uh, and, and there are some non-cardiovascular mortality. And you may say, well, is it related then to AS? Uh, maybe to some extent, because if you have a patient dying from uh, renal failure or, or, or other type of, uh, of, uh, of cause of mortality, to some extent, the AS may have contributed to, to that, you know, uh, because of worse in the genetic statutes, uh, more rapid deterioration of the renal function, etc. So I think we need to be comprehensive. And to me, the best, the best, uh, the best endpoint and more robust has always been all cause mortality, because you know, and this is what is it, and, and quality of life. I think this is something that we are not looking. Enough. I think we always, you know, as as investigators, we pay a lot of attention and weight on the hard endpoints, uh, the mortality, the hospitalization, and the slow. And then after, yeah. but I think we need to be more patient-centered outcome now. And I think, you know, uh, especially the work we've done with KCCQ in partner, you know, high opener, you know, and, uh, and for the patient, this is what they, they mentioned is important for them. Okay, yeah, I want to live longer, but I, I, I more importantly, I want to be better. And I think we have to um, to do better better job that we do in our, in our trials and include more this as primary endpoint now. I don't know if you like secondary. So, yeah. Ron? Yes, hi, that was an amazing talk with so many different things. Yeah. Uh, in one small area, in deciding about ejection fraction, and you're using echo and you need three different echoes to show that it's relatively low or low normal. How often will you go to MRI or some other way to more clearly identify ejection fraction to use 3D echo? Yeah. So interestingly, the guidelines, they, they say three serial imaging study. And this is on purpose. I think they're really um, uh, giving you the message that um, echo, yes. Uh, so if you, have, if you confirm by three echoes, you're, you're good to go for earlier intervention. But if you do echo and then you do CMR to confirm, uh, I think that's probably, uh, and that's what we do in our institution. You know? If I see an echo, uh, one echo, uh, the LDF is now like more, looks like it's less than 60. 60. We, uh, because then there is an important decision to take and we are considering an earlier intervention, we send the patient to CMR. Because, you know, although I'm a big fan of echo, uh, there are uh, several things, a few things. Uh, that the CMR is doing better and, and LVF better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This was amazing. And uh, as a surgeon, I have to ask a diverse skeptic question. 
That's <laughs> it. Okay. So, uh, my main dilemma is actually moderate AS trials. And the reason I ask you, you're the master of it, is for balloon expandable valves, we may be replacing, especially in small annuli, a moderate AS into slightly better than moderate AS with small balloon expandable device. And in a self-expandable trials, we may be giving 10%, 15% patients a pacemaker. Do you think these are the main limitations of these two trials? Because we're just going to replace one disease with maybe some other disease. And it's going to take us a really long time to understand the real benefit in a subset of patients where this will be really useful. So that, you, you I, this is so important. And this is why, you know, I have, although I'm actively, as I said, I'm actively involved in those trials and I'm a big, big fan. And uh, um, I also have some reservation, you know, and at first because, as I said, we still have a large portion of the population who already established indication, CVAS, class one indication, who actually did not, do not undergo SAVA or TAVA for many reasons. So I think we have first to fill this gap before it's time. And, and yes, I think the main limitation, is, especially in moderate AS, and maybe to some extent also in asymptomatic severe, is that um, uh, we propose to put a prostate valve that has also some limitation and complication earlier in the stage of the disease, earlier in the life of the disease, earlier in the life of the patient, and therefore in patients with longer life expectancy. And so we expose them to a risk. And as I often say to my, uh, my fellow, when we replace native valve stenosis by a prostate valve would replace a disease by another disease that we hope is going to be milder. But prostate valve have uh, first, as you said, uh, they may improve uh, um, they may change a moderate AS into a mild or almost as moderate, you know, because the hemodynamic is not perfect. They may, they may bring some new paravalve leak. They may bring pacemaker implantation. They have a risk of uh, valve thrombosis, even if often it is subclinical. They do not last forever. That's maybe one of my most reservation, most important reservation, you know. With TAVA, because it's going to be TAVA validated for moderate ATS, we don't have any SAVA harm. Um, uh, we don't know yet the long-term durability. We have encouraging results up to seven, eight years, but we don't know. This patient will, will need to match ideally to match the proven durability of the valve with the life expectancy of the patient. In moderate AS, we may need 10, 15 years at least, and we don't have this track record with TAVA valve. So I think, yes, I think we will have to, and regardless will be the results of the trials, the uh, asymptomatic CD or the moderate at risk. Um, we have to keep in mind, and maybe they were gonna be positive, maybe they're gonna be negative, but let's say they are positive. These are average results. This not, does not apply to all patients, and we'll still have to individualize, to personalize, using cardiac damage staging, you know, looking at the risk versus benefit ratio. Say, okay, we take the risk of implanting a valve sooner, but because we have advanced cardiac damage staging, because we have this and this, we, we think it is worthwhile. So I think, and, and I will finish there, but there might be a role, a niche for non implant Technologies that are currently being validated, such as the Leaflex uh, technology, as you know, which is a, a technology where it's a mechanical valve loplasty. So you kind of address the, uh, you reduce the severity of the stenosis, but without leaving, leaving any device behind, any pacemaker behind. So that, and, and you buy some time. That's the purpose. You postpone the, uh, the, the, first, the first intervention. Because then, as soon as you have the first intervention, you are in a lifelong management strategy where it's, oh, okay, now I have a TAVI, so it's a young patient, oh, okay, maybe in seven years we'll come back, what do we do? Okay, TAVI, TAVI, ah, no problem. But, you know, TAVI, 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 there is a limit to that, right? And then at some point you may need, okay, now I cannot do any more TAVI, TAVI. The patient is now 78, 80 years old with some comorbidities, and I need to do the big surgery to remove all these have and now put it out and then it's in your hand deep with me and you know it's going to be difficult cases right so i think we have we have to think about lifetime management and if we can buy some time without device even if it's two years it's great i think uh, and, and i think that was one of the great take home messages at the very end you say personalizing individualizing the treatment because applying 
you know, by phosphonates or all these calcium things to everyone does not apply. Yeah, same for intervention. One same intervention prevention. fits all will not work. We need to remove that. Well, I wanted to thank you all for sticking around. Have a great week, and thank you so much again, Philippe, for this wonderful. <laughs>